the do we do the center last time we talked, I think we just the acoustics just to make sure we can be heard. Yeah. Um, it, I mean the opera physician trying to ask the poet how he organized the poem. You know, it's, it's like asking a rose about horticulture. But uh, when you when you came to do this, how did you how did you sift through those memories? You managed to build memory. I mean, I'm connecting with it, and I think I speak for everybody here in terms of uh, you know you make common cause with our memories somehow. It's very beautiful what you do, and, and I'm thinking, all right, how did you enter this space? How did you remove the things that would get in the way? And, and that sort of thing. How did you go out? What happened about my first picture, which was disembodied to life, and that was about my mother, my father, my two older sisters, and my eldest brother. I'm the youngest. So pretty slow and depressing. <laughs> I said it's a gift. <laughs>
because the voice is still alive and it, it, it's indelible there. But you, the, your handling of the bullies is really wonderful because they, they do carry the weight of the terror that they bring in, but somehow they don't disturb the ecstasy. That's, that's what's very interesting, that he is sustained by more darker and darker films in a way. You start hearing Ambersons and you start hearing Great Expectations. And it, it, it seems that you were you in organizing this listening to old film clips, seeing a lot of film to try and trigger memories, or, or did you? No, because I had seen the mothers, so I was able to Yeah. I, I, I was taken to see um, The Lady Killers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My, my brother, my oldest brother, who was a rocker, I, I think he called him old Sean, man. He loved, he absolutely adored comedy. And we had, we had wonderful comedians, uh, comic actors, rather than comedians, um, those days. And, that was, well, I mean, I'll give you an example of how important these little things were. They were tiny. He had no money one day. The, the, the doctors were on strike and he had absolutely no money. Um, this was when I was about four, I eight, two minutes later. Um, and he walked down the road and there were eight cinemas within walking distance of my house with, with, without the eight that were already in town. And um, there was a, a, a lovely art theater cinema here called Majestic and a big pub called the Prince of Wales. They had him take up two shillings, which is about you know, ten cents. And he thought, shall I go and get a pint or shall I go to the pictures? And he looked across to see what was on with Majestic and it was kind hearts and horror nights. Uh, so it's all part of that texture of and when you love them and I, I, was, I, I remember when I was, I was still quite young, I was eight, seven, eight, I think, being taken to see um, The Happiest Days of Your Life, which is, I was just in the model Rutherford, um, which is why it begins with a, a quote from that, from that film, where the bomb being banged. What she actually says is, um, a tap on my gong wouldn't have any Scottish dress mm -hmm. And she says, a tap, not so I said, a tap, you're not really using the film. <laughs> But people who don't know those voices think they are the voices of the people who lived in that street. That's fine, I don't mind that, um, that ambiguity. That's what it should be. But I mean, it was so easy because I loved all these films I quoted from, um, especially, again, The Lady Kills, um, when The Last Jews of Spy yeah. um, is Ali Guinness and a clever one. Yeah, they're running around and they say, Louis. Just wonderful. So, and, and Tammy had to go in. Yes. I, was, I, I was taken to see Tammy and the Bachelor. Uh, um, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderfully sentimental song. Um, I think it has some of the worst lines in lyrics, but very, very, very treasurable. I'd sing like a violin if I were in his arms. <laughs> That's pretty awful to go away with that. There's something rather wonderful about it. Um, um, so all, the, all my life felt rich. To go to the movies any time was, you know, you'd go, the lights would go down, the curtains would come down, and it was such magic. Um, I remember seeing the first Cinemascope film, which was The Road, mm -hmm. and the curtains went back, and the audience gasped at the length of the screen. Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful performance by Joe Robinson as Caligula, and he's as camp as Christmas, but he's absolutely fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and I memorized all his dialogue. And many years <laughs> later, my first trip to Los Angeles, someone said, is there someone you want to meet? And I said, yes, there is. Uh, I want to meet Joe Robinson. And they said, who's that? I said, he played Caligula in The Road and Demetrius and the Daddies. I said, I want to meet him. So we had tea together. And I said, I know so no one And he said, no, you don't. I said, yes, I, yes, I do. And I quoted the dialogue. And he said, what made you, what made you like this performance? I said, it is so outrageous. It's so outrageous. And there's this first scene in a slave market. He has this scepter. And every time he holds the scepter like this, and every cut back, it's either further up or further down. So, oh, he got away with it. I'll never know. But it's very, very funny. That's great. There's a wonderful, speaking of ambiguity, there's a, 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 a just one that tickled me when we're, we're going over their heads. You know, we've gotten used to because of the, the audio of the movies. And we think we're looking at a movie theater, and then suddenly we hear the bells and everybody's standing because it's mass. And I just thought, you know, the, 
movies as the escape from religion and religiosity was struck me with the struck me the beautiful touch. Is that could you talk about that a little bit? That theme. Well, uh, at the end of the film, I wanted to sum up my what my entire world was, and it was a very small world. It was my house, my family, the street, the church, the movies. That was it. Very tiny, and I, we didn't have a lot of money uh, to make it. Um, and so I, I wanted to try and find a way of doing it that would be succinct and quite frankly cheap. Um, and that's when I came up with that idea. Um, but the, the tracks that are in different places uh, and other is the um, overhead track. Down the street and then back up again. But all the others, it was exactly the same space. I mean, you put the camera on a map like this and just to alter it. And then you can just track right to that. That's, because that's all we could afford. Um, so I was trying to sum up what my life was. And it was very small and modest, but it was, it was so, it felt, it felt so rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, the, the title itself is very rich, too. You have, I mean, you have that magnificent hymn at the end, The Long Day Closes, but one, you know, one grows up, even here in America, you hear, you know, growing up we were taught, you know, the sun never sets on England because, you know, that was the, during the days of the British Empire. Now, of course, the sun began to go down because people were, various nations like India were getting away from the, the UK, but, uh, and The Long Day Wanes was a, was a title by Anthony Burgess, but The Long Day Closes sort of, I don't know, it's, it's so rich because it suggests England at the end of an era, and the closing of memory, and, and, and then you open with the clip um, it's from the Lady Killers as a Mrs. Wilberforce, you know, room to let Mrs. Wilberforce. And uh, just the name Mrs. Wilberforce is so funny in relation to British history. And 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 there there's that as your opening line with the rain pouring into that wonderful tenement. Um, and I, I just want to ask you just about the meditation on England, if the, how, how how conscientiously you were weaving that in, and uh, you know, well, but that wasn't conscious because I, I was only a child. Um, that wasn't conscious. It was, it's only later that I realized something like Lady, the Lady Killers mm -hmm. um, was actually a very funny story um, about the heist. But what it actually is about, it's about the whole failure of England, of Britain. Because every member of that gang is from a different ca class, but they're all failures. It's about the end of the empire. You know, and also how um, the innocent causes absolute destruction, and that was for all of Alexander the Kendrick's work. Yeah. And, and when he taught at film school when I was there, I said to him, it, it seems extraordinary that in all the films, it's the innocent that does the destroy. And he said, yes, I know that. Other people have said that too. Um, and I was making my, my graduation film, you know, which was the second part of a film called Madonna and Child. And I had flu this particular weekend. And he went to see my, my graduation film. And um, we came out of the uh, cutting room and someone said, what have you been to see, Mr. Kendrick? He said, uh, Madonna and Child. And he, the, the person said, it's a gay movie, isn't it? And he said, not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very treacherous. <laughs> well, let's open it up to questions from the audience here. Um, let's see, do we have anybody, any burning questions? And I may repeat your questions for everybody in the back, yes. Uh, the opening scenes and the closing scenes, uh, are, create an, uh, an aura of destruction, decay, uh, like a war or something. What, 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 what were you, what did you have in mind poetically for these opening scenes? He's asking about the opening scene with the, you know, the, 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 the well, he regrets for the symmetry of the opening and closing scenes. So that, that they evoke destruction or the destroy. The first part is, you know, you've got the ruined building okay, with the rain pouring through it, and then in the end you've got, you know, the clouds moving across the sky, the imagery of destruction. Could you talk about what went into your thinking and planning? Well, uh, we were living in a, a, a slum, we were in a local slum, and towards the end of the 50s, there was a huge um, increase in slum killers, and the whole cities were virtually demolished, and they built these awful houses and flats, which in 20 years became slums as well. But it, uh, uh, I, we were the last people to actually leave my street, and ours was the only, ours was the only house standing. Um, but I, 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 it couldn't be that. I wanted that street to look derelict because of all the people who used to live there. I can still remember everyone who lived there, where, where they were. I just can. And I wanted to recreate it. Now it's dead, it's all gone. Um, and 
for some utility of the drive to that thing. So in fact, the, op the opening shot is in a way a flash forward from the lad who's sitting on the on steps, steps yeah. you know, which is me. Um, it's not a question of deliberate destruction or decay. It's, it's a question of, at the time, politically, people really did mean well. They really wanted to clear these stones because they were dreadful. I mean, they were rat infested. The whole parts of the house you couldn't use. Um, but they built it cheaply. And in 20 years, as I say, they all became slums. And those new buildings are, are, are now all pulled down. Um, but it, it is perhaps a decay of the heart. Because I, I was so happy. We have, it, you don't have to have a lot of money to be happy. But I was ecstatically happy. Going to the movies. I, I, I love my primary school. My, my, I lived for my sisters and their friends coming around on Fridays because I could go about the main club. Um, they, this seemed to me to be enormously glamorous, enormously rich. You know, which, and I felt it with my whole being. I didn't know that as a child. Of course I didn't. I was too young. Um, but the quotes from the films are all from films I adore. I just adore them. And Hand Pulse and Collins, I think, is the greatest screen comedy. Nothing can touch it. And I love Some Like It Hot. But even Some Like It Hot can't compete with it. It's so utterly perfect. Um, and Joan Greenwood, I mean, what a joy that woman was. Um, oh, to me, that man from this boy, man, in England. She says, in, in London, she says, in the whole world. <laughs> Tell us, but you know, 
that are going to preserve the National Health Service in the ZPL. We hold hands out for 1948, mm. and they're still the same. It's still a party of privilege. Most of the cabinet have gone to Eton or Harrow and Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, it never changes. I mean, the country will never change until we get rid of the aristocracy, what's left of it, and the royal family, who are parasites par excellence. <laughs>
the guilt of it, of being inculcated with guilt about everything. <laughs> awful, just awful. Because every time I prayed, God was out. Yeah, <laughs> 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 You're a question.